Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this time we are saying farewell to the Olympics. The closing ceremony is on Sunday and we're recording this on the Friday before that. But we are going to say hello to books that we love that have heroes that we enjoy rooting for. As we're sharing our heroic titles, if you'd like to get your hands on any of them, there's several different ways to go about doing that. The first and probably the quickest is to call your local branch of the Monroe County Library System and speak to the staff there. Anybody will be happy to assist you and make sure that you get a copy in a format that works for you. The second is to go straight to our online catalog and request physical versions, hardcovers, paperbacks, audiobooks on CD, and that web address is on your screen now. And finally, some of the titles that we talk about are, are available through our two digital platforms. The first platform is Overdrive, or you may hear it referred to as Libby. Libby is the name of Overdrive's app, and Overdrive provides downloadable eBooks and audiobooks and also magazines. And our second digital platform is Hoopla, and Hoopla provides downloadable eBooks and audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And the great thing about Hoopla is if you see one of those items and it has a lightning bolt next to it, that means that there is not a wait for that item. And the vast majority of items on Hoopla, there's no wait. Um, instead of having to wait for somebody else to return it, it means that lots of people can have the same item checked out at the same time. So I like Hoopla for that when I just need something to listen to. I am Jennifer Grinuski, and I am the community librarian at the Dundee branch. And I do really love the Olympics. I know that they are not everybody's cup of tea, but I really enjoy them and I can watch pretty much any sport. In fact, we started watching rugby and I got so involved, I had to look up the rules and got real excited for the New Zealand and Fiji men's final rugby battle. And I have to say, I kind of prefer rugby to American football. It's a lot faster. You can watch a rugby match in literally 15 minutes rather than three hours. So I really enjoy the Olympics. I love seeing people who have put so much time into their particular sport be challenged and excited about competing. Um, but our question for this week is, who is one of your heroes? And for me, this was hard because there are a lot of people that I look up to. Um, I didn't end up going with a sports hero. I'm not a super sporty person apart from the Olympics, um, but I ended up going with one of my personal favorites and one who I hope that I am learning to be more like, and that is Mr. Rogers. Um, he just had a, as a kid, you don't appreciate it. You just watch the show, that was nice. And then you kind of make fun of him, you know, when you're in high school, oh, Mr. Rogers. And then as an adult, it starts to hit you how powerful what he did was. He met kids exactly where they're at. He met any human being in his life where they're at and accepted them as who they are in that moment. Not what they're gonna be, but who you are in this moment is amazing. And I hope that I do that for the people in my life, that they know that you're pretty incredible just as you are. And I just, and I've read biographies about him and I just think that he's a person whose simple philosophy of life and his faith made him a person who brought good into the world and good touched the lives of everybody who he spoke to. So that's one of my personal heroes. Also with us this week is Mandy Draganic and Mandy is a cataloger who works out of our administration building. And who is one of your heroes, Mandy? So well, I really, really struggled with this because there are so many people um, that I admire and Fred Rogers was probably in my top 10. Um, so I sort of decided to go with the cop out answer and really truthfully, the people I admire the most are all of the people who just do the right thing when no one's looking when nobody else knows, when nobody else will ever find out maybe, they just do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. So mm -hmm. like hundreds and thousands of people fit in that list, so. <clears throat> That's wonderful, thank you, Mandy. Also with us this week is Jessica Otto. 
who is our head of the collections department, making sure that all of the materials, digital and physical, are coming in and getting out to the public. And who is one of your heroes, Jessica? Uh, so my my hero, the, the first answer I had for this and the is that all the teachers at the Monroe County Intermediate School District that have worked with my two daughters, Lena and Lacey. Um, both of my daughters are a special needs and there was a time when we were told that they might not even speak. And through the years of working with the teachers at the ISD, they are now, they can count and they can, they know their alphabet and they are starting to use words um, with purpose, using words to request things. And um, now my oldest even knows that I'm mommy and can say mommy. And um, I can't tell you how much that means to me. And they, all the teachers there at the ISD, they are truly my, my heroes, my family's heroes. Oh, thank you so much, Jessica. That's amazing. And then also with us this week is Amy Luck, who is one of the front desk staff at the Dorsch Library. And who is one of your heroes, Amy? Well, again, very hard, but I'm going to um, say my father because he was born in 1926 at about two pounds. And they just told my grandma to take him home, you know, that he wouldn't make it. And I heard stories about them putting him in a shoebox and warming him by the oven. And he grew up, had some health issues, but he grew up to be a very successful man, had 11 children and taught all of us, all of us to be good people. And I think that makes him my hero. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, let's just stop here, folks. I think that we've heard <laughs> all the good things we need for today. We'll just stop here. Go go to your library, check out some books. No, thank you. That was awesome. Um, so now we're going to share our titles with heroes in them that we were rooting for. And let's have Mandy, would you be willing to kick us off? Sure. All right. I'm going to get your slide up here momentarily. I think I'm I think I may be the only one who chose a fictional hero, um, but I kind of did that on purpose because I'm a little bit sneaky sometimes. Um, my fictional hero is from The Waterkeeper by Charles Martin, and I think I've talked about um, Charles Martin, the author before. Uh, the Waterkeeper is the first in a fairly new series about a guy named Murphy Shepard. Um, he He's a good guy. He's got a good heart. He doesn't always do things quite exactly the right or proper way, um, but he does them with good intentions. And in The Waterkeeper, um, you learn that he has a lot of secrets. Um, and I won't share those because they're like worked out throughout the book. But he, you also learn that he personally is responsible for rescuing um, possibly hundreds of young girls or women um, from human trafficking. And it's just, it's not his livelihood. It's not his job. It's just a thing that he does. And I don't know. It's just, it's, it's a thing that's been on my heart a lot lately. And, you know, there are so many people who are, who are involved in human trafficking. There's like 14 to 18,000 people in the U.S. There's like 40, plus million people worldwide that are impacted by this. And so while I read about Murphy Shepard, I couldn't help but think about all the real life people who, who do it. He does. Like, I'm sure not as, as wild and crazy as the character in the book, but, you know, it's just a thing they do. And again, they just step in because it's the right thing to do. So as far as Murphy Shepard goes, you know, he's a pretty cool guy. It's an interesting read. Um, there's a lot of redemptive factors um, to both him and the girls that he saves in all of their stories. Um, it's a little bit predictable, but, you know, I like that. I enjoy predictability because I don't have a whole lot of it in my real life. So I like to read about it in, in fictional lives. Um, so Murphy Shepard, <clears throat> uh, the newest book in the series just came out this year, I think, but I haven't read that one yet. So. Um, my next one is 
Kayla Steckling, and her book is titled hmm, Fear Gone Wild, um, A Story of Mental Illness, Suicide, and Hope Through Loss. Again, she's another one that when I read this book, I just couldn't help but think about all of the other people who live in her shoes. Her husband was the pastor of a, he was a young pastor of a mega church in California, and he struggled with depression um, and ultimately took his own life through suicide. Um, she's been criticized quite a bit for this book because she tends to not use all the politically correct terms. Um, she says what she felt and how she felt it, and she makes no excuses for that, um, which I really do admire. Are there better ways to th say things? Yeah, but you know, it's really how she felt. So um, again, there there's just so many people in those shoes. There was a study last year that says more than 59% of Protestant pastors that were polled admitted to suffering from depression and 75% of them never sought or seldomly sought counseling. And suicide on its own is something that's still very much stigmatized. Um, pastors with depression, right there with it. So for her to just be open and honest about her husband's life, their life together and her life since, um, for me, it's just a very, very admirable thing to stand up and speak out about. And so important to speak up about mental illness that it's not mental illness doesn't pick and choose, right? You know which families it's going to hit. It affects everybody from all walks of life. Yeah. Um, so I'm I have not read her book. I've not heard of her before, but I'm sure that it will help others out there who may feel that they are stuck in that same situation and to know that they're not alone. Yeah, so, they're not alone, and there is still hope. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mandy. Okay. And let's have Amy share her heroic titles with us next. Okay. My first title is I am Malala. Um, what is, um, I don't know what the rest of the title is, but I am Malala. Um, I guess that's it. Um, she is a young girl who lived in Pakistan and like she's not very old. She was just a young girl in like 10 and 11 and when the Taliban came to their town and her father who started a school and thought that even girls should be educated because that was the future of Pakistan, the Taliban didn't agree with it. So um, they pretty much thought women should be secluded in their homes and not speak and not be seen. The only time they should be outside is if they were with a man and that the man should speak for them. Um, Malala did not believe this, so um, she went to school and then the Taliban made a rule that anyone over the age of 10 couldn't go to school. Any female over the age of 10 couldn't go to school, but she um, fudged her age and went anyway. Well, as time goes on, the Taliban gets more and more brutal. Um, anything that a citizen did from wearing their pants in the wrong way to um, whatever they deemed not okay, they would shoot them and leave them in the street so the other citizens could see. Well, Malala stood up for education. She said, I am going to be educated. And um, she was on a bus going to school one day when the Taliban stopped the bus and got on and asked which one was Malala and shot her and two other girls. She got shot in the, in the face. And so she was shot because she wanted an education and um, they rushed her to England to um, have many surgeries and stuff, but Malala didn't give up. She just kept, kept talking for education and girls being educated. And um, she's written a book for children. She's written, um, she actually, when she was just young girl, wrote for the BBC um, under a fake name so that she could say her thoughts on what 
what it is she believed about girls and education and how wrong the Taliban was. And so, you know, for a young girl in that scary situation to just keep going and going, I'm she's my hero. She's my hero. Definitely. She's she's been she's amazing. I've not read her book, but I have heard her speak via TV and YouTube and things like that. And she's incredible. Yeah, she's she's amazing. And my other book is not really about just one person. Um, it was written by Brad Meltzer, who is um, a, a author who has written many, many books, but he wrote um, Heroes for My Daughter. It's about ordinary people ex um, achieving the extraordinary, and it is a juvenile book, but it's such an easy read, and it's so amazing that adults would love this book also. Um, a lot of the people in this book are um, well known, but many aren't. Um, one of um, one is Carol Burnett and Lucy Ball. The Three Stooges are in there, um, and what you see on TV doesn't even touch the surface of who they are. So it it explains. And there's like I think 60 different people. Marie Curry's in here. There is one little girl that I really want to tell you about, and I have this book here because I love it so much. I want to tell you Audrey Hepburn. Um, there are a couple sports stars in here, but a lot of them are just ordinary people. This little girl's name is Alex Scott. She was four years old, opened what is arguably the most successful lemonade stand in history. She was diagnosed with cancer before her first birthday. Um, and let's see. Um, so it was the only life she knew. When she was four, she asked to put up a lemonade stand in her front yard. It was her idea, not her parents, but hers. She didn't do it to buy a doll or even to pay hospital bills. She told her parents she wanted to give the money to the doctors so they could find a cure for all the other children diagnosed with pediatric cancer. Again, her idea. In a single day, she this lemonade stand raised $2,000. Soon, stands began popping up all over with her name on. Every year, she went back in the summer to sell, and eventually they raised $200,000, but she didn't think it was enough. She wanted to raise a million dollars. So on June 12th, 2004, hundreds of lemonade stands opened across the country ordinary people selling water, sugar, and lemons to raise money for kids with cancer. Nearly two months later, Alex passed away while her parents held her hands. She was eight. Make no mistake, the $1 million goal was surpassed. And before she died, Alex said the next year's goal should be 5 million. Today, her dream has raised over $45 million and it's still going. Um, one idea, one girl, one big dream. And then they, in for all of them, there's a quote or from the either the person they're talking about or someone said something about them. And this one is from Alex herself. She says, oh, we can do it. If other people will help me, I think we can do it. I know we can do it. And so, there's men, there's women, there's famous people. Even Lisa Simpson is in this book. And because, <laughs> because she stood up for herself and um, she learned that um, you just keep doing it. If cartoons were meant for adults, they'd be putting them in prime time. <laughs> but it is a fabulous book. I'm um, really just ordinary people and many you haven't heard of, many you have that you would have never guessed their stories of why he chose them. So I understand he's also written one for his son. So that might be another choice, but I liked it because of the ordinary people. They didn't have to be someone famous. They didn't have to be a star athlete, and some of them were, but 
just ordinary people like little Alex and great to share with your daughter or your son or even read it yourself. It'd be great for a classroom too. It's just a wonderful book. Sounds like it. Thank you so much for those titles, Amy. Yeah. And now we will have Jessica share her heroic titles. Thank you. Uh, so my first title is Easy Company Soldier by uh, Sergeant John Malarkey. Uh, so John Malarkey was a, a paratrooper in World War II. He was awarded the Bronze Star uh, for heroism um, and the part that he played in D-Day uh, Normandy um, in June 6 of 1944. Uh, most of this book, um, he, he spends talking about his time uh, during the war, his experiences from training to war, from um, the invasion of Normandy all the way to the next summer um, where they and he ended up in Austria uh, they ended up in Austria um, but he does um, talk a lot also about his life outside of the war um, he starts out by talking about his childhood he grew up he was born in Oregon he grew up there in Oregon um, it was very interesting to me to learn about Oregon and life in the Pacific Northwest in general because it's not an area I am familiar with that I've never traveled there. So that was very interesting to me. Um, and um, he also talks um, a great deal about his life after the war, um, especially immediately after, and the challenges that he had with reintegrating into society after being um, a soldier for three plus years. Um, and specifically, he talked about the struggles that he had with education. Um, a lot of the soldiers returning took advantage of the GI Bill, and he did, and talked about the struggles that he had and that um, life after the war, things just didn't seem to come as easy to him as they had. And I really appreciated him going into that because I feel like that probably was a common struggle for a lot of the soldiers um, returning home from the war. And he does then go on to talk more about his family life and the children that he and his wife had and um, uh, his life uh, thereafter. So it was um, it was a, a great read. Um, I highly recommend it. Um, my second title um, is Call of Duty by Lieutenant Lynn Buck um, Compton. Um, th this book, so um, Buck Compton was also a paratrooper in World War II. He was awarded um, the Silver Star for um, Valor in Combat, again in Normandy um, in June of 44. Um, he, in this book, it's a little different than the first in that um, he only spends a little bit of the time in here talking about his experiences during the war, but he talks a great deal about his life outside of the war. And this entire book was just fascinating to me. The amount of life that this man put into his 90 years was just amazing to me. Um, he starts out with talking about his childhood, um, growing up in Los Angeles during the depression and about how in order to help his family make ends meet as a child, he, um, he entered this program that they had at the movie studios in Los Angeles at the time, and that they needed they needed children to be on set to be extras in movies. And so they basically had this school set up at these movie studios where kids could come and attend school. And whenever the studios would need um, like somebody of a like a child of a certain description or certain hair color they would call to the school and say hey we need somebody this around this age this hair color and the kid would leave the class go film the scene and then come back to school and um he actually talks about how a lot of his classmates in that program um went on to be really famous movie stars um so i won't i won't uh, dish on the names you'll have to read the book to find out who but i, I just thought that it was fascinating um, so, and he also talks a lot about his life um, after the war. Um, he also um, took advantage of the GI Bill and used that to attend law school. Um, while he was in law school, he also worked as a policeman um, 
full time as he put himself through uh, through school. He worked in the burglary unit um, to begin with, um, and then eventually, when he completed law school, um, he went on to work as a prosecutor. Um, he used his degree for that, and he talks a lot. and And he's in um, he stayed in the Los Angeles area through his life, so he talks a lot about the different um, cases involving um, different famous people throughout times that he was involved with. Um, and in particular, he talks a lot about um, the trial of um, Sirhan Sirhan, um, who was um, convicted in the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Um, and he talks a lot about, um, so um, Buck Compton was actually the chief prosecutor on that case. And he talks a lot about um, the all the details and the planning that went into this. Um, I know there's a lot of people interested in the Can the Kennedy family and all the different things. So if, if that's of interest to you, I highly recommend this book. It was just um, fascinating to me. And it really, really struck me as the kind of person that he was, that he talked about that, although, you know, that Robert Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, as he calls him, was really popular. And although he felt that maybe perhaps his own politics did not line up with Bobby Kennedy's politics, that when this assassination happened, that it just incensed him, that he said, this is the United States and this is not how we do things. This is not how leadership is decided. Um, people don't just get to decide that because they don't like someone, they're going to they're going to kill them. They're going to shoot them. He said, we we decide things at the ballot, not with bullets. And so because of that, um, and because he, he recognized that at this point in history, in 1968, that America was really scared that um, two months before Robert Kennedy was assassinated was when Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. And he knew that, you know, the country was really, a lot of things were going on that was scaring people. And so he knew that he... He wanted to do this right. Um, so he talks about all the work that they brought together, this task force of all these um, top level people from different um, crime and criminal investigation units to do this because he wanted to do this trial right. Um, he wanted to do right um, by Robert F. Kennedy, and he wanted to make sure that that there was nothing, nothing lost on any sort of technicality in the trial. And so I really found that section to be fascinating and just to learn about all the the criminal investigation procedures in um, the 60s was was just really fascinating to me. Um, so then he goes on to talk about um, how he finishes up his career. He eventually became a judge and really liked his role in that um, and then eventually uh, went on to in retirement um, have his own radio podcast. Um, it was just a, a lot of fascinating stuff. So I. I I highly recommend um, this book for anyone, not just for um, those who are fans of World War II history, but just American history. And he's just, he was just a, a great guy. And I really recommend this book. It sounds like he's exactly how you described him, that he lived a lot of life in the time that he had. That's a lot. Wow. Yes. Yeah, he's, he really was, it was one of the most inspirational um, autobiographies that I have read in a long time. Wow, thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. And for my heroic titles, um, Mandy mentioned she thought she was the only one who chose a fiction book, and I actually chose a fiction book too. My first title here, uh, My Name is Resolute by Nancy E. Turner. And first of all, I just have to say, if you just like good storytelling, um, Nancy E. Turner, you should pick her up. I think she's got maybe seven or eight books out there. These is my words is my favorite, but my name is Resolute covers a period of time in American history that I feel like there isn't a lot of historical fiction about and maybe sort of gets overlooked in that market. So my name is Resolute takes place between 1729 and 1781. And it focuses on a young woman named Resolute. And she is actually born and raised on the island of Jamaica. And privateers come to the island and her family owns a sugar plantation. And they take all of the enslaved people on the plantation. They take the family. They basically burn the crops. 
and take whatever they can to make money off of. And Resolute ends up over on mainland, was, wasn't yet the United States then, but in the colonies without her family, without the lifestyle that she was kind of used to, and she has to figure out how to survive. And I will say in my notes, I've read this, it's probably been six or seven years. I will say that in my notes, I say the first hundred pages were hard because I didn't like Resolute at all. Like she was just frustrating and irritating and she's a very prickly sort of character. Um, but she grows through the novel and the history was fascinating um, because starting with Jamaica, and what Jamaica was in 1729. And then you move through the French and Indian War, you move through the Revolutionary War, and you see Resolute's perspective and how she survives through all of those. Um, it just, if, if you like history, it's a good one. If you like strong women who you might not like all the time, um, it's a good book as well. Cause you feel like about, by, the end of the book you are rooting for Resolute and before then as well you start to realize you know she's changed she has a character arc um and so you're rooting for her and what she is able to do and what she sees in this very early developing country you know what would it have been like to be in the middle of all of that you know I read it in history books um, and I don't read enough nonfiction, but I remember learning about it in history and it feels so dry. But if you were in the middle of that, particularly the French and Indian War, which I feel like I knew nothing about, um, it's fascinating. And you do begin rooting for Resolute as she learns more of who she is and that the kind of person she wants to be and that she can be and is capable of being. So that's my name is Resolute. If you haven't read Nancy Turner, highly recommend her. And then my second title is nonfiction. And it was actually the um, Monroe County one book, one read choice for um, I think it was April of 2020. And the author, Dr. Mona Hanna Tisha, was actually going to come to Monroe County and speak. And of course, everything shut down with the pandemic and she was unable to do so. But I would have loved to have heard her come and talk. Um, so that is the reason I picked this up was it was the one county read. So what the eyes don't see, a story of crisis, resistance and hope in an American city is about the Flint water crisis. Um, and I grew up in Flint Township, right on the outskirts of Flint proper, and my parents still live there. So this is close to home. Now, Flint Township, because they are a separate governing entity, they did not have their water supply switched the way the city of Flint did. So my parents were never personally affected by the water crisis, but they were there in the midst of it, seeing how it was handled and mishandled. Um, and Dr. Mona Hanna Atisha comes into the story around 2014. She is a pediatrician in Flint and she starts to hear things and she's actually had a cookout and somebody had some information about an environmental inspector and some of the water testing that had been done. And she had also heard a concerned mother who had said just like holding up the water and looking at it you know, and they tried to tell her, oh, well, it's, it's, you know, this, that, or the other thing. It's not the change in the water. You know, you need to have your pipes changed. The mom tries to say, like, we had them all changed over prior to this and we're still having issues. Like, so Dr. Mona starts to realize there's a crisis here and she begins working on it as both a doctor and a scientist and looking at the lead levels of children in Flint from the time of the water change to at that time, I don't know how long it had been. Um, and they start doing testing and they see that, yeah, the lead levels in the children had risen. And it's quite a fight because um, nobody wanted to admit that this was happening. Nobody wanted to believe them. Even they took a lot of time in the scientific process that they went through to release the results of the study that they did. Um, they made sure that it was reviewed by other people, so it was peer reviewed. 
they did everything that they could because she didn't want to put it out there in the world if she knew she couldn't stand up and say, this is real, this is happening, these are facts, um, and we need to do something. We can't just sit there. And she got a lot of pushback that, nope, this is wrong. You know, these aren't, this is, these, this study doesn't say what you think it says. Here's what our study says. So even then it was a fight. Um, it was fascinating. Um, Dr. Mona does believe strongly that government can do good, that it doesn't have to mishandle things. It doesn't have to do things poorly. It can work on behalf of the people it's supposed to, but sometimes you got to fight for it. And sometimes you got to stand up and say, what you're doing right now is wrong. And we've got to fix this for these children, for these families. So it's a re it's a really interesting book. Um, I will say that I listened to it and she actually does the narration. And I was really concerned about that because sometimes folks who are not professionals, um, whether it's in acting or reading or whatever it might be, um, it's real. It's, it can be a struggle to listen to them. And she was fabulous. So if you like audiobooks, it's also a fabulous audiobook. Um, and it's eye opening and it's right here in our own state. You know, it's just an hour and 15 minutes north of here. Um, and I think it's important to see that it happened. I was shocked when I read it that it had happened before, not in Flint, but in the Washington DC area. And I had no idea about any of that. Um, so, so, so she's one of my heroes because she took the skills and the knowledge that she had listened to people, believed them and said, well, let's find out what's really going on, whether this is what's happening or not. Um, and then she took it out there and and made the change, did what had to be done despite the sacrifice for her as a mother, for her as a wife, um, for her as a doctor sometimes, because a lot of her time was going towards this. Um, and she didn't have a lot of time to spare. She had a lot going on. So she is one of my heroes for standing up for what is right. Um, so thank you to all of you for sharing your books with heroes. This was really inspiring to listen to. And um, next time we are going to, oh, August is Happiness Happens Month. So next time we're going to be sharing books that make us happy. So thank you to all of you for sharing again. Thank you to those of you who listened. We hope that you enjoyed the Olympics and we hope that this maybe makes you think about the heroes in your own life. Have great weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.